who will present a talk on the integral forms for uh, the geometry of supergravity. So thank you so much, uh, Antonio. The stage is uh, yours. OK, thank you very much for the invitation. I, so I've, I've seen the, the previous talks by Laura, by Jorge, and by Evelyn that um, there are a lot of uh, work regarding the Chen Simon theory, supergravity Chen Simon theory. And so uh, together with Leonardo Castellani and uh, a young collaborator, uh, Carlo Cremonini, we wrote uh, some work, some papers about uh, Chen Simon supergravity. But uh, today, I, actually, what I would like to, to give you uh, somehow a flavor or uh, some ideas that uh, we have been developing uh, together with the Castellani, together with the Cremonini and other friends uh, in the, uh, like Roberto Cartenacci, Simone Noia, about uh, how actually you can um, extend the powerful framework of uh, general relativity, namely using uh, the thermophilms invariants, and there are four, the form language uh, uh, that has been used in uh, uh, differential geometry, I would like to, uh, to know how to extend this uh, technique to uh, supergravity. Namely, I would like to formulate supergravity and all the related theories using the same type of techniques that has been used for general relativity. But this is not, this is not a new uh, subject. This was, uh, I mean, the, the first, per first person that started to do this project actually was uh, Tullio Regge in Torino, but then was developed by Riccardo Dauria, Pietro Frey, Castellani, and all the uh, people in that community that developed what is also known as group manifold approach uh, or reonomic approach. This is one side of the game, namely to formulate it using differential calculus, using Cartan calculus, using Lee derivative, using differential and forms, you to develop uh, supergravity theories. And that has been done in very several examples, like uh, uh, supergravity in four dimensions, in higher dimensions, in 11 dimensions, and discovering a, a lot of uh, new uh, interesting ideas. Okay. Um, however, there is another sector, the theory that was uh, somehow hided for a long, uh, for a very long time. Okay, and uh, so here there is a, a brief summary that what I, I'm going to talk, uh, I want to tell you. I will give you some idea how to uh, generalize this uh, differential calculus to supermanifolds. It, actually, I introduce superforms, which are the well known superforms that you find in the books. But uh, besides them, I also introduce integral forms, which are slightly different object, which, are, which has been used. Uh, in the string theory, and nowadays it can be used also in quantum field theory and in supergravity. And then I will tell you how to integrate it in supermanifold, and then how to construct an action. And I will give you a couple examples. And actually, I would like to give you a chance. I'm well. I'd like to give you a three-dimensional supergravity action in this uh, framework. This was a, a work that I published together with Castellani and Roberto Catenacci uh, some years ago, like three, four years ago, uh, about this subject. So let me first uh, um, give you just a brief, uh, um, brief history, okay? Which is the following: you know that in string, th uh, let me use this one. string theory, okay? String theory, when you actually you want to do some calculations, you actually you do the following things: you calculate some correlation function of some operators in some points, okay? You have some points, you calculate uh, this correlation function where these OI are vertex operators, vertex operators. However, uh, when you actually you move from bosonic string theory to super strings, okay, that calculation, it's uh, it become quite complicated. The reason is that there are two quantum numbers, quantum numbers, which are the following. One is what is known a Gauss number. And the second one is known as a picture number. Okay, and those numbers are uh, dependent on which kind of correlation function you want to calculate, okay? But they have to be saturated in such a way that the, this correlation function has to be different from zero, okay? And actually the Gauss number somehow can be related to the form degree of uh, a differential form. And this picture number is, a, is a related to the, a, a picture number for 
differential forms, which I'm going to tell you how uh, how to actually to to uh, to relate this uh, how to construct this picture number for a differential form. So therefore, when actually when I really want to integrate or really want to calculate such a collection functions, I really have to saturate both these uh, numbers. Actually. actually, form degree it is well known because if I do some integral, okay, suppose that I do some integral on a manifold and I want to integrate some form, for example, a p form, okay. Actually, better be that this degree of the form p actually is equal to the the uh, top degree, and which corresponds to the dimension of the manifold. Okay, in such a way that the, this integral is a different from zero. Otherwise, what I have to do is I have to restrict my manifold to a sub manifold. In such a way, the uh, the integration on a sub manifold on a form degree which has a degree which is less than the maximum degree has a, a, a correct, a, a well defined reparameterization invariant object. Okay. Now I want to do the same object, but instead of having a manifold here, I want to replace it by a super manifold. And so there are four. When I integrate the super manifold, I have two numbers: a form degree and another number, which I will call it picture number, in such a way that this calculation is different from zero, okay? So, but because now the my manifold is no longer a, a manifold, but it becomes a super manifold, and therefore I need the these two numbers, okay? Actually, there is a nice dictionary between the language of uh, string theory and the language of uh, uh, form, um, of a differential form in supergravity, but I'm not going to explore more. So in order to, uh, to make uh, the things a little bit easier, I would like to, uh, to refer to a specific uh, super space, okay? A specific super space, which is the following. I consider just the three bosonic coordinates, which I'm going to call it XA, okay? And two fermionic coordinates, which I'm going to, Call it theta alpha. Okay, so my my super manifold my super manifold has a local description local description as a super space r slash three two. Okay, so there are any functions that I'm going to call it a super fields is just a function of those coordinates x and theta. Okay, and 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 then I define one force. Okay, and one forms, I have two types of forms. I have the forms which are called the XA, okay, and they satisfy the following commutation relations. If I exchange the XA with the XB, I get the minus sign with respect to the wedge product. Oh, sorry. Okay, and I also have another type of forms which is just theta alpha, which, uh, which commute with the, uh, the, um, the bosonic ones, XB. Wedge d theta alpha. Okay. Actually, we have there are two ways to do uh, the things. Actually, I can make it also anti-commuting. This doesn't change, but one has to keep it consistently either commuting or anti-commuting. But the more important one is that if I calculate the commutation relation between the two d thetas, okay, they do commute. Okay. So I treat them. I treat this object d theta alpha as uh, some bosonic. Or commuting uh, coordinates. Okay, so therefore my cotangent space, the cotangent space, it is parameterized by the coordinate xa, theta alpha, by dxa, the one forms, and d theta alpha. Okay, so this one is a bosonic, and also this one are commuting. Let's say commuting variables, and this one and this one are anti-commuting variables. Okay, I, I'm, I'm sure that everybody uh, in the audience knows this. Everybody knows in the audience, but the main important things is, is uh, the observation that I'm going to treat those variables as purely commuting variables. This has a, a dramatic effect when actually, I, I want to do some integration because if I do an integration, suppose that I want to integrate a, a, a super fields, okay, a super fields. Let me write down uh, this symbol has been introduced by Witten some time ago in order to keep track uh, of the what are the variables on which I am integrating on. Okay, so suppose I am write down in this way the three x 
and the D two theta. So this doesn't have any meaning of a measure, okay? It's just only to keep track of the notation and to see what are the integration variables, okay? So don't, don't, don't try to understand this as a measure, but just only a, a, a notation to keep track of these uh, integration variables. So when I have to do in this integral, what I have to do? Well, I have to apply two things. One is just a, a Berenstein integral, Berenstein integral, which means I have to take the, the derivative, the uh, derivative with respect to fermionic coordinates, d square of f x and theta, and theta equal to zero. And then finally, I have to integrate on the x. Okay. So this integral here, this final uh, object here, is a final number. Okay. So this is just a Bernstein integral, and the last one is just a, a usual Riemann-Lebesgue integral. Okay. So I needed these two steps to do the calculation. However, in, in the usual uh, bosonic manifold, for a given manifold M, okay, when I want to integrate something, I actually better integrate a, a top form. Suppose now, let, let me set the dimension of M is equal to three, okay, which is just a bosonic dimension three, which is a common in Chen Simon theory, for example, which is just the dimension of your world volume, which is three dimensional ones, okay. So if I integrated this object here, actually I can separate the integration in two steps. First, let me write down this omega-3, the three forms, in terms of local coordinates. So this will be a function of x. And then times, or what? Well, times some measure here, some, uh, okay. Or let's say, if you like, I can also rewrite in, in, in this way, okay? I can write down this in component a, b, c, dx, a, dx, b, and dx, c. But since they anti-commutes, then I, I can uh, everything rewrite in terms of omega a b c epsilon a b c d three x okay and this is just the function here now here I forget I actually I just uh, take uh, the the metric on this manifold just a flat one so I don't get any square root of g otherwise I would like to have like a square root of g here in order to keep track of the uh, the curvature of the manifold. Now we know that the DC integral it is a well-defined reparameterization invariant um, integral, which actually which is uh, which is needed in order to formulate a consistent theory of gravity in three dimensions. So everything is written in terms of forms. This is exactly what we have seen in this uh, talk by Evelyn, where actually he was writing everything in terms of form, because then automatically we know that the calculation and then uh, the, the result will be reparameterization invariance by itself. Okay. Now, if I, uh, so please note that there are two steps of the integration. The first step is just only to separate the top form from uh, a, a function in, in, uh, in, um, in the local sense. And therefore, uh, the last step is just the integration of the riemann lebesgue integral. So what happened for the supermanifold? Well, for the supermanifold, I would like to integrate on the supermanifold. Again, here, I take the dimension of my supermanifold equal to three slash two, okay. What I have to do? Well, here I have to put something which is just a three slash two form, okay. In such a way, the three is just a usual, usual bosonic dimension, but the two is just is these bosonic dimensions, okay. And then, okay, this object will be a function of x, theta, dx, and d thetas, okay. However, since those are commuting variables, actually I have to define how to integrate on those variables. Okay, there are several ways to do it. Maybe there are several um, ways to define a consistent way to do it. However, uh, it, is, uh, um, it comes quite uh, natural to use for those variables a specific measure, which is called an atomic measure. Namely, we just actually, we localize those types of uh, expression here around a very special point where there are some product of delta Dirac of d theta, okay, in this way. So we introduced this uh, strange object, which is theta alpha, d theta alpha, which is a kind of a distributional, distrib distributional, distributional, like form, okay? So this means what? Well, if I integrate on the delta of d theta, that just give you one, okay? Because this is just a, now kind of algebraic definition of an integral. Namely, I'm integrated on a delta function of d theta that 
just giving you one, okay? But there are several, uh, um, several let's say, uh, caveat in this definition. First of all, okay, if I add an index here, this d theta alpha, this object here is not generally covariant. Namely, if I perform any transformation of the data, for example, suppose that you transform a Lorentz transformation of the data, that will go some un, some under um, transformation of this type where lambda alpha beta is an element of a spin three, okay, uh, which is an element of the Lorentz group in three dimension in the spinorial representation. This object will not, certainly not transform in a covariant way. However, if I consider two of them, d theta one times d theta two, okay, and that's actually transformed in a, in a very interesting way. If I do the calculations, okay, if I do the calculation, I found out that this transform as one of the determinant of lambda, okay, of delta of d theta one of uh, delta of d theta two. For, for that, I need only to use the properties of delta function with one exception that I never use the, uh, to put the modulus on, on, the, uh, on the transformation. The reason is I keep the orientation of my d theta uh, in a fixed way. So therefore I, I never needed to put a modulus on this transformation. This is very important because otherwise if I have modulus here, I don't get the minus signs, okay? But however, if I don't put a, 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 the models, I have to keep, um, I have to, to be very, um, uh, to be very um, cautioned about some calculations because otherwise I get into paradoxical uh, results. Okay. However, all the calculation can be done in a very straightforward way. So, um, so what does it mean this expression here? Well, this expression means that actually uh, you see that if I do this calculation, you immediately find out that d theta one wedge delta d theta two. Now I'm treating it just as a generator of, of a new type of forms. Okay, and they anticommute in this way, and that I can check that they anticommute by using just the uh, the. Uh, um, the question above, okay, if I say, if I perform a transformation, a large transformation which exchange the d theta one with d theta two, immediately found that I get this minus sign. So these two new objects here, uh, they anti-commute uh, with respect to the wedge of power. So therefore I define my integral forms, integral forms, integral forms as something, okay, like the, three slash two as a, just a superfield x and thetas. And then we have some power of the x a, the x b and the x c. Let me put in this a, b, c. But also we have delta two of d theta. This delta two means exactly what I wrote before, delta of d theta one, or delta d theta two. I can also write down in a more covariant way, but I mean, it doesn't change, it's just only a notation, but the, the, you have only to keep track of this type of trans transformation rules to, uh, to understand how this object transforms, okay? Then finally, if I want to integrate the, such an object on my supermanifold for omega three slash two, what I have to do? Well, to do the integration, I have again a, a several steps to do. The first steps is, uh, first of all, let me write down this as a fu function in this way, epsilon ABC, then I keep track of this, okay? Then I have a delta two of D theta. Okay, so the first integration I will do, I will do just integration of this d, d theta, which means I remove delta of the theta. And of course, any, any other dependence on the theta will be set to zero because that's localized the, my function around the, the point d theta is equal to zero. Then here I'm extracting the top form with respect to uh, the, the bosonic variables, okay? And then I'm left with the Berenson integral and with the Lebesgue integral. So the final result will be some derivative of this function, ABC, epsilon ABC. And then finally, I have my riemann lebesgue integral at the end. So that will give you, um, gives you a number uh, or a function, uh, it depends on what you are doing, okay? But which is completely consistent with the all um, required. Now, what is actually very interesting now, this object here that I wrote here, this uh, omega three form, it is now a top form in, in, uh, in, the, in the superman. So let's me compare to the bosonic manifold. Let's make a, a kind of a dictionary. Okay, we have the bosonic manifold, manifold M. Here we have a super manifold. 
Sn, okay? The dimension here is three, the dimension here is a three slash two, the coordinates are Xa, uh, and here the coordinates are Xa theta alpha, the one forms here are dxa, and here they are dxa and d theta alpha, okay? And the top form will be a three form, which can be written as a, just a function, which is called a section of the canonical bundle, if you like uh, to use a more mathematical language. And here we have a, a, a section, which is again a function, which is now a super function, a super fields of d3x and delta two of d theta. Okay. This is a, a section of what is known the Berezin bundle. Why this is so? Well, uh, it, it is a very interesting to see how actually uh, the Berezin come into the into the game. Okay, let me show you that. Okay, okay. So we know here in the bosonic case, for example, if you do the calculation for a curve manifold, it is better to go to this what is known as the Firbein basis. Okay, in the Firbein basis. Let me write down in this way. The, the, those are the, my function, the Firbeins along the x m. Okay, so these are my curve coordinates. And these are my and my fear binds. This is a notation that I use uh, imported from the book by Leonardo, Ricardo, and Pietro, actually, where this is the fear bind, and this is just the function which represented my fear binds. Okay. When you do the calculation, of, for example, of the V, uh, let's say, let me do the calculation this way omega three, okay, which is just F A B C V A B B A B C, okay. And then if I plug this equation here, I can rewrite this expression this way, ABC, epsilon ABC. And then what I got here, I get the determinant of E, which is a, a three by three matrix times three X, okay? Now we know this is just a, what is usually called E, which is just the super determinant of the, it's just the determinant of the, of the field. Does it work also in the case of super manifold? Yes, it does. I have to do the same calculation here. Money here, I have a super field bind. Now the super field bind is made of two ingredients. I have a VA, okay, which is again, I expand in this way. Now here we get the super fields, DXM time XA. And then let me expand around the, some, also some fermionic coordinate, let's say theta M, okay. But also I have the super field, which I use the notation of the book, which is uh, actually in some sense that would represent the gravitino uh, in, if we have a dynamical situation, but in this case is just is just the rigid super field by, of my super manifold. But still, let me write down and expand in, in, to, in terms of super field in this way. I have E alpha mu X and theta d theta mu, okay? So this is my uh, expression for the super field bind, okay? And then finally, if I do the calculation of omega three slash two, which is, as I said, is just a function of X and theta. And then here, let me put what? Well, let me put the index A, B, C again, D, A, D, D, B, C, delta two of psi, okay? So if you do the calculation, it turns out the following, F, A, B, C, now here I have what? Well, here I have to put all the expressions. So I get A, M, D, X, M, plus A, M, U, D, theta, mu, and so on, okay? But then I have a delta of what? The delta of E alpha M, D, X, M, plus E alpha mu, D, theta, mu, okay? And then I have to do some calculation. Now, here I use the property of the delta functions. I use the property of anti-commutation relation between dx and d theta and so on. And then it turns out that gives me f a b c, epsilon a b c, and then I get a super determinant of the matrix a m, a mu, a alpha m, a alpha mu, times d three x delta two of d theta. Okay. So here I get exactly what I'm expecting, the, the super determinant, not the determinant like in the bosonic case, but the super determinant. So this means that this omega three, actually, it is exactly a top form, okay? And as expected, like in general relativity, this is a proportion to the super determinant. 
Okay, this is a very nice observation, which actually tells me also that this object transform under any super parameterization invariant as a really a top form, namely it transform using the super determinant of the Jacobian transformation, which is exactly what you expect in a super gravity, or let's say in a super manifold when you perform a change of variables at this time. Okay, so if, have a, if there is any question, I'm happy to answer also during the seminar, please. Okay, so now what is the next step? Okay, the next step is, okay, I have uh, now uh, this uh, integral forms, omega three, two, okay, which is, let me write down again in a schematic way, in this way. So I have uh, some Vs here and some delta two of psi. I, I use now the notation using the Fierbein's and psi because then automatically can be promoted to, to dynamical fields. So the Fierbein becomes the super free balance and psi becomes the gravitinos in this extended um, notation here. However, there is one additional uh, bit that I can add to this expression, okay? Now we know the following, okay? We know the following. Here, okay. We know the following, that when I write down, oh gosh, when I write down a super form, okay? Let me write down a super form now. A super form, let's suppose that the super form three, okay? And then I put a zero, to uh, remind us that uh, this is just a normal super form that's actually is expanded in terms of details, okay? So this means I can have a function which depends on x in theta, depends on v and psi. So a super form usually is expanded in these ingredients. For example, one component will certainly be something of this type, x and theta, va, vb, and vc. Then certainly we have another terms like a b, uh, let's say gamma, which is just the A, V, B, Psi gamma. And then we have F, A, beta, gamma, V, A, Psi, beta, Psi, gamma, and so on, okay? Now we know that, for example, that in the case of superforms, there is a no upper bound. So namely, I can build any superforms of any degree, okay? Certainly I have some functions, okay? And then I have some power of these, okay? Some power of these Bs and powers of Psi. Okay, the power of pi, which is like n minus p. Okay, so the total number, the total number of this gives you just the degree form, which is just n. Okay, so we know that for the superforms there is no upper bound. So I can build any superform of any degree. Okay, so there is no upper bound in, in this in this case. Of course, there is a below bound, which is just are just the functions. Okay, so the zero zero forms are just the functions of x and beta. Okay. On the other side, on the other side, if I write down a, a super a, an integral forms, as I said before, I have this object, which is just a function times three Vs, let me put the three Vs and the delta two of psi. Okay. But then of course I can have something with less psi V at the end. For example, I can build an integral form which has a two form degree, which is just a V, V A, V B. V A V B and delta two of size, okay, in this way. So this is a two form with the picture number two. The number of the picture correspond to the, the number of Dirac delta function that I put here, okay. okay. And uh, the form degree is just, in this case, given just by the number of the Fierbein that I put here. So the delta carries a no form degree, but it carries a pictures, okay. But the, the V carries a no pictures, but a form degree, okay. But then I can do one additional things. I can do the following. I can take a derivative respect to psi of delta functions, okay? So, okay. Now this means that I take a derivative of the argument of the delta function. And this has to be understood in the following way. So if I calculate, say, if I multiply by psi this expression, I do a partial integration. This can be written as a minus of delta two of psi. So I use a partial integration. So I use again the uh, properties of Dirac, of Dirac distrib or distribution. Namely, I can do partial integration in this way. Now I can view in two ways. You can see, you can view, I can pass psi through the derivative and if psi hits this, and this is just again a distribution equation which tell me that the psi hitting a delta of psi, this gives you a zero because psi set psi is equal to zero. So if I multiply psi for delta two of psi, then automatically zero. Those equations are distributional-like equations. So that have to be understood under the integral sign, maybe measured with some uh, test function. So if you really use the 
the, the correct the terminology that will be distributional type of equation. However, you can do algebraically. So all the, the calculation that I, I've been doing uh, are a uh, type of algebraic um, calculation. So it's very easy anyway to, to perform this calculation. However, if I add this uh, derivative of respect to psi, it turns out the following that the derivative psi, since it is the derivative with respect to one form, somehow it decreases the, the form degree. Okay. Actually, to be really um, correct from, uh, from the Cartan calculus point of view, this derivative psi that corresponds to a contraction along a vector field, along a vector field. So let me write down this way. So this is a, a not the vector field, a not the vector field. Which, for example, let's say, let's, let's make an example, just a derivative respect to theta alpha. This is a node vector field. You take a derivative respect to the fermionic coordinates, this is a vector field, which is a node vector field. And the derivative respect to the psi corresponds to the contraction along a vector field. And then, of course, I have the usual um, pairing, namely the contraction along a vector field of a psi beta. That gives me delta alpha beta. This is the usual pairing between a one form and the vector fields in this way. Okay. Let's say I can also write down the pair in this way in d alpha, and this gives you delta alpha beta. This is the same notation. This is the pairing, and this is the pairing written without, with the contract. So therefore, I can also construct a, 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 a integral forms of this type. So I have just a function, x and theta. I can put some v's here, okay, some number of v's. Then I can put the de derivative, derivative respect to psi. Okay? And here I can put any number of derivatives. This I can put any number because those are commuting uh, variables. And so therefore, the partial derivative with respect to them are also commuting variables. So therefore, I can add any number of them, okay, uh, and delta 2 of psi. Of course, this expression here has to be understood always by integration of by parts. Namely, if I hit here by, uh, by expression but contains in some psi, then automatically I have to use partial integration to do the work. Okay, so therefore it happens in a very interesting fact. Okay, suppose that here I set up the following situation. So I have here zero, then I construct zero forms. Let me put zero, zero forms. Then here I have omega one, zero forms. And then I have omega two, zero form. And then I can go forever. Okay, and then the operator which maps along in this way is just the usual differential. Okay, but on the other side here I have a, a, another complex which is called a an integral form complex, which is goes to om one, two, omega two, two, up to some point, which is omega three, two, and that's it. This stops here, but it can go negative, omega minus one, two forms, omega minus two forms, and so on, okay? Okay, so therefore here, you see this complex is unbounded from up above, and this complex is unbounded from below, okay. So the two complex actually, and actually it is very nice to see that are, are also isomorphic. So if you calculate, for example, the relation between uh, the number of generator in those expressions, you find out that there is an isomorphism. Okay? So then you can put a relation. For example, there is an isomorphism between this space and this space. There is an isomorphism between um, this one and this one. There's an isomorphism between these two and so on, okay? So there is an isomorphism of those spaces. Namely, if you count the generators of um, uh, forms in those spaces, you find out that there is a nice isomorphism, okay? Which allows you to relate uh, those terms. And actually it is uh, the natural way to define a Hodge dual transformation for a super manifold. The Hodge dual transformation it doesn't it does not act on a single line, so it doesn't move on a single line. The Hodge dual uh, operator, but it actually exchanges the two lines. And the Hodge dual maps, for example, if you calculate the Hodge dual of zero zero form, it maps to omega three slash two four. Okay, which is a natural thing, so because we know that the Hodge dual operator it is it has be built in the following way. So suppose that I'm starting from a zero zero forms. Okay, what I actually I like to do is the, this expression, okay? So this is the natural expression, which means take a, a given form, calculate the Hodge dual, and then you calculate the integral of the supermanifold, and that has to be different from zero, or it defines the correct pairing between the two type of forms. 
Of course, when you do the calculation of the Hodge dual, it doesn't map in the same space, but it maps in a different space, which is just a three slash two form. However, we know that this is just the volume form, which is just the integral of the super determinant of E on my super manifold, which is the volume form. Of course, it might happen that the volume form could also be zero in some case or not well defined. But however, this is just um, technically uh, what is the result. Okay, so the Hodge dual operator, it doesn't work along a single line of the forms or the or super forms, but it exchange in uh, super forms with integral forms. Good. What I can do with this, all this machinery, which is a quite interesting machinery? Well, I can do the following, okay? Suppose that now I want to define actions, okay? Suppose that I want to define actions in my theory, okay? What I do, do? well, I learn from the Torino group, let's say from this group manifold approach that I have a, a nice way to do it, okay? If, um, let, let's suppose that I want to do it super gravity, okay? Super gravity means the following. I need the following. I need the fear binds, okay? I need the spin connection and I need the gravity of fields, okay? Then those are my physical degrees of freedoms. Okay, those physical degrees of freedom are first promoted to some superfields. Okay, or let's say to some superform x and theta. So the, my spin connection will be x and theta, and the gravitino also will be uh, promoted to some gravitino fields in this way. Okay. So the second step is to define uh, the the curvature. Well, again, let me define the curvature as derivative covariant derivative d a and maybe. Uh, plus i over psi, gamma a psi. And those are equations which also Laura yesterday and today has been shown. For example, the curvature are the uh, just the usual d omega a b plus omega which omega a b plus uh, psi, gamma a b psi and so on. So I define the, uh, the curvature in this way. Those curvatures satisfy the Bianchi identities. I'm, I'm going fast here because I'm pretty sure that everybody knows better than me what actually I'm, I'm talking about, okay? And then you define what is known as a rheonomic parameterization or in other language are called also conventional constraints in super, in super space constructions, okay? Okay, and then allows me to, re to define the curvature, the torsion. For example, you said that the torsion is equal to zero, then you write down the curvature in terms of the uh, Riemann tensor, uh, as, uh, as, yeah, where it was, and so on, okay. And uh, every time expressing this way. So the final result is that you can build out of this ingredient an action, okay? Let me, uh, let me do in three dimension, an action, okay? Which depends on what? Depends on the connection, it depends on the firma, and depends on the size, okay? What are the property of this? Well, first of all, it's a three form. It's a three form, okay? Two, okay? It is, uh, it is invariant, okay? Under Lorentz symmetry, okay? Three, okay? It is, maybe it is closed, okay? Three, zero, okay? Let me first do it in this, in this uh, case. So it is closed. So dl3 is equal to zero. Okay, please notice uh, that this equation for a super manifold, namely dl3 zero is equal to zero, this is non-trivial equation. Because actually, uh, if you look at the, uh, the equation uh, uh, coming out of this uh, closure equation, it gives you some important constraints. So it is non-trivial uh, equation, which is very important. Actually, this equation it is related also to the existence of auxiliary fields. This means that actually, when the, uh, you're working in higher dimensional space with a uh, lot of supersymmetry, this equation might be not achieved. Okay, okay then, and then we come up to, with the variational principle. Variational. In order to get the equation of motions, okay. The variational principle, uh, reading in the book, is just a manifold, a three-dimensional manifold inside of a super manifold, which is three slash two, and then you integrate this object three, zero. Let me put it in this way. Okay. However, when you, I try to do this calculation, well, I have to decide somehow what is the embedding of this three-dimensional manifold inside the super manifold, okay? So embedding means that I have to choose how this bosonic manifold is somehow immersed inside, inside the super manifold. 
However, there is in geometry a specific way to do it. It is called a Poincare dual. Poincare dual. Okay, so given immersion M3 immersed in supermanifold 3 slash 2, it exists a form, let me call it eta, like in the literature, such that the integral on the supermanifold of L3 slash 0 wedge eta, okay, that gives me exactly my action S, okay. Okay, and of course the embedding would, would depend on which is the embedding, or let, let me call it I, the embedding. Uh, so I can say, I can relate it to I, which is just the embedding that I'm doing. Okay, but you see that in order to do this embedding here, actually, uh, in order to saturate correctly, as I said before, this object must have a zero degree from a from, from degree, but has to be picture number two. Okay, and so in such a way, the total number of from degree and picture must be three slash two. Okay, so this object here, okay, it is interesting. It is being invented also in string theory. And this object is known as a picture changing operator. Ch picture change operator. This was invented, they introduced in the string theory, okay. But now it plays also a role here. What are the property of this? Well, the first property is that it is closed. Zero to must be zero, okay. Second property, it is not exact. So zero to is different from D of something, okay. And third, any variation, any variation of this eta zero to, it is exact. Any variation, it is exact. Okay, so those are the property of the Poincare dual. Okay, you can read, the, for example, if you take a common book and very normal book, bottom two on the differential geometry, for example, it is explain all the geometry. So everything is, is written in uh, differential geometry books. So we have done nothing from this sense. The only fact is here, this form that we introduce is not a normal form. It is a, an integral form in order to, to do the integration, as I said before. Now, let, let, let's see what are the property now, the action, okay? The action, which is just integration of super manifold, which is L3 slash zero wedge eta zero two, okay? I dropped the I at the moment because I, uh, I will show you what is, um, why actually I can drop this I uh, referring to a specific embedding. Please notice the following. Now, eta, it is defined up to exact terms, namely, since this is, d is equal to zero and eta must be different from d of something, which means that eta belongs to a cohomology, a zero to cohomology of my super manifold, okay? And then a, met, a quite important subject that we are studying together with Carlo, Alberto, Cremonini, Simone Noia, Roberto Catenacci is to study those cohomology, which is a different, uh, let's say, seminar at the moment, okay? However, okay, since this is an element of cohomology, so th this means I can change the representative. I can change this representative to another representative, which is different from the first one by exact terms. Let me put a sigma here, okay? If I change the representative, let's see what happened in the action, okay? I have a super manifold, the Lagrangian, which is the Renomi Lagrangian, okay, eta plus d sigma, okay. Now this sigma, however, it doesn't change the, the Lagrangian because if I do integration by parts, so let's suppose that we don't have any boundary terms. Of course, if I have boundary terms, I have to do some modification. But if I do integration by part, I have d l three zero wedge sigma, okay. But now this object drops out because my Lagrangian is closed. So this means if my Reonomic action, it is closed. So if this object here, it is closed, okay, then automatically I can choose my representative as I wish. So I can change uh, my representative and I choose a different type of representative. But not, not only that, I can also choose the embedding because I know if I change the embedding, this uh, picture change operator, it changes by exact terms and therefore my uh, final action, it doesn't change. And this is a quite important observation. Now, so if I change the representative, let me give you two, two examples of representative, okay? Uh, which is quite interesting. The two examples of representatives is the, the first uh, very simple example is the following. I can choose the following example, which is just uh, theta 
square of delta of d theta. Okay, theta square means theta alpha, epsilon, alpha, beta, theta, beta, okay, which is just the usual uh, invariant quantity made of two the thetas, okay. And then it is easy to show that it's closed because if I act on d theta, I get d theta, alpha, epsilon, alpha, beta, d theta, beta, times two, okay, delta two of d theta. Then you see here there is d theta and d theta in front of the delta function. I use the distribution law, delta d theta is equal zero, then automatically this is zero. It is also easy to show this is not exact, okay? And then let's see what happened if I plug this in the action. So let's do the calculation. I have the action, which is a three slash zero. That's all, of course it depends on X, on theta, on the axis, on D theta. And then I multiply this by theta square of delta two of D, of D theta, okay? Now you see the following. First of all, the delta functions project this to zero. So this is my super manifold. So it projects this function to zero in this way, theta dx and zero here, okay? Theta square of delta two d theta, okay? So I get zero here because of my delta function, okay? And second, because here there is a theta here, then automatically this project also to zero, this also becomes zero. So the final answer is just a super manifold integration, sorry and then I have L, L3, zero, which is now projected X zero, DX zero, and then theta squared delta two D theta. So this means my, if I do the integration of my super manifold, I end up with just a three zero, which is X zero, DX zero, which is just the component action. Component action. Okay, so I get automatically my component action in, in, in the three dimensions. Okay. Can I change the representative? Well, yes, I can change the representative. For example, I can choose the following representative, which is now I can write down in terms of Firbines, VA, wedge VB. And then here I have a derivative respect to psi, gamma, uh, yes, gamma AB, derivative respect to psi, delta two of psi. Now, this expression, it is uh, interesting because actually it is a uh, fully covariant. So all my indices are contracted, okay? So this means it is Lorentz invariant, okay? So it has a zero form degree because you see this carries a full two form degree, two degree forms, okay? And this carries only one minus one, this carries minus one. So the total form degree is zero, but has a picture two. So this is exactly zero two. And actually you can show that uh, the difference between this and the, uh, the picture change operator that I showed you before is just exact terms. Okay. Now, what happened now if I plug this expression in my action, okay? If I take this calculation again, let me now write down in terms of X theta, Vs and Psi, and then here plug it, VA, VB, derivative respect to Psi, gamma AB, derivative respect to Psi, delta to Psi. Now here you see, here there are, I already have two Vs, okay? So this means I have to, to, uh, to extract from this expression one single V. And now here the two, two derivatives with respect to Psi, and by integration by parts, here I have to extract from this expression, okay? Something which is a proportion to Psi, okay? So if I do the calculations, if I do the calculation, I have to perform all this calculation, I have to extract, okay? And the result, it is very interesting, the result, I get an integration now, which is a still integration on, on my super manifold. So I, I find the final integration of my super manifold of D three X and D two theta, okay? Which is just a super space integral. So namely, if I change the representative, I can change the representation of my action, which is the first, I got the component action. And now here I'm getting the super field action. By using this uh, framework, this uh, technique, actually, we can relate the, uh, the renomic or the geometric approach to supergravity to superspace approach. Superspace approaches, we know that is very powerful in some sense, because everything which is written in terms of superfield, then automatically we know that it's respected supersymmetry. So if you take a superderivative on superfield, 
If you multiply the superfields, you get the superfields. Everything it very well uh, works very well. I mean, there is a, even a, a super conformal calculus which is built around this structure. Now, if you calculate this uh, uh, superfield structure, then automatically you have a super symmetric action. But now here actually we translate it into really differential geometry by using this technique. Okay. Uh, let me um, get this. Uh, okay, so this means the final action I, that I'm right now is on a super manifold. Here I write down this my renomic action times a, a picture change operator. Okay, a picture change operator that allows me to choose this representative. I can change this object here. Okay, of course. Uh, so together with uh, some collaborators, we analyze several models and actually we find out that we are able to really map uh, this all the possible version of the same theory, like in superspace or in harmonic superspace or in uh, component action using different picture changing operators. Now, of course, one actually would like to choose a different picture change operator to, I mean, to achieve the best possible formulation in order to do the calculation. And that can be done by choosing this, uh, this object. Okay. Um, now, in the case of, for example, of supergravity, in the case of three-dimensional supergravity or chain simon supergravity, it, uh, the calculation can be done. And actually it was done by uh, myself, uh, Leonardo Castellani and Roberto Catanacci. And actually we show indeed that the aeronomic action, uh, uh, which can be written in terms of Firban, indeed can be rewritten in terms of a super field. And it turns out that this calculation gives exactly an integration of the super fields, which is just, a super field version of the Riemann tensor times super determinant of E, okay, which is the, the correct uh, super field. Okay, well, what, what else can I do? Okay, uh, let me give you one result that is uh, quite interesting, which was, was not uh, achieved before doing this uh, calculation, which is the following. Suppose that I want to add a cosmological term to my theory, cosmological, cosmological term. Okay, in three dimension there is a very natural way to do it. Okay, in three dimension I just do the calculation this way. E, uh, so let, let me do it with by V A wedge V B wedge V C epsilon A B C. Okay, that would be a, a, a cosmological terms. Okay, of course it is well defined. Is it is a three form? It is integrated on the map. Okay, so what can I do? Well, can I do the same things for a three slash two manifold? Well, okay, yes, I can do it, okay. And here I have to do something like omega three slash two, okay, because now it's a true three form. And here we have something like that, which is just a, a epsilon A, B, C, V, A, D, B, B, C, and then a delta two of size, okay. And then here, finally, I can write down, this gives me just a super determinant of A that in three dimension, it does correspond to the cosmological terms, okay? Now, there was a, some times ago, uh, work by uh, Gabadaze, uh, Deram, and Toll, if, I, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Actually, they invented the, what is known as a bi-gravity models, actually, where actually you can have uh, not one single graviton, but uh, several gravitons, but then by uh, suitable filler definitions, uh, you can show that one graviton becomes the massless graviton and the rest becomes massive gravity. Okay, if you do it in a naive way, you immediately run down in, in the problem that the degrees of freedom of this massive gravity are not five, but become six. There is a ghost, which is known as a Bolwer desert ghost. So let, let me repeat the, this, uh, the situation. We have N firbines. And firbines, okay. And then you just do it, just a change of coordinates. And this gives you one plus n minus one. And this is just a one massless graviton, which is just the usual graviton. And these are massive gravity, 
massive gravitons, okay? However, uh, if you do it in, uh, in four dimension, this will give two degrees of freedom. But if you do it, let's say naively, you get the six degrees of freedom for massive times, of course, n minus one, okay? But this is six is not the correct uh, uh, degrees of freedom for a massive graviton because it must be five, okay, in, in four dimensions. So there is a five plus one, and this is a ghost, which is called a Bollower Desert Ghost. However, in order to eliminate this ghost, you have to choose a specific set of interaction. And the interaction between these uh, n gravitons are the following types. Uh, this I'm, I'm writing in three dimensions. Okay, if I have one graviton, E1, wedge E2, okay? Or for example, E1, wedge E2, wedge E3, okay? So the all interaction types are kind of the cosmological interaction types. If you do it, you can prove that actually the, the Bollower Desert goes decouple from the theory and it doesn't interact and the theory is consistent. Those couplings actually are easily written in terms of Fierbein's, every, every time uh, written in terms of three forms. But how can I do it in the same game for a super, uh, for a super graph? Well, in exactly in the same way. So, namely, I can write down something which is again like uh, VA, VB, VC, ABC, delta of psi. Uh, let me also write down this in a more covariant way, in this way, epsilon alpha beta. Delta C alpha, delta C beta. Okay, but then I can choose for each of them a different, uh, a different uh, Fierbeins. For example, three and five. For example, here I'm choosing the five Fierbeins, and for them I choose here, for example, the bosonic Fierbeins for uh, the Fierbein for the first graviton, and here I choose the super Fierbein four for the fourth graviton. Okay. In this way, I, I'm, I, I'm automatically know that uh, this action will be supersymmetric invariant. Actually, it is a local supersymmetric invariant because this is a, a super form, which is a, an integral form, is a three slash integral form, which is a consistent. You can do the calculation and you find out all the possible couplings. So the powerful of the um, general relativity written in terms of differential form is now translated in this language of differential geometry. You can build uh, action starting from uh, this, uh, uh, this construction. Namely, you can build uh, action starting from three slash two integral forms, and which has a quite interesting property. So together with the, uh, some collaborator, we are studying a different type of model. For example, chiral boson can be written in this way, super chiral boson, M5 uh, supersymmetric theories, or uh, for example, super gravity or super Yamis in this frame. So I think that, uh, I, so I try to convey uh, this, the following message. If you actually want to do differential geometry for a super manifold or for super gravity, better be to consider also these integral forms and to analyze in the, the integration and in super manifold in the following, in, the, in, the, in, this, uh, in, this, in this way, okay? And um, so I hope that uh, uh, I give you some ideas how we can do the calculation in this way. And I hope that will be useful also for your uh, analysis, uh, your studies. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I'd be happy to answer all your questions, of course. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Antonio, for the very nice and interesting talk. And uh, are there questions for Antonio? Yes, I see you're raising hands just. Uh, uh, Oh no, sorry, they were plausible. How do you, uh, how, uh, you say that you can uh, add this, uh, um, uh, uh, let me say this way, you need a, a, a closer to Lagrange, three dimensional Lagrange, for example, three dimensions. And this only uh, exists if uh, there are uh, theory fields. Yes, right. And uh, what uh, I am asking if uh, this uh, method can be extended also to non uh, closed Lagrangian, because in a higher dimension, usually you, you not have, uh, uh, you have no auxiliary fields. Yeah, right. So how can you evade uh, this uh, problem? Okay, let me, let me tell you what actually, what we know. Okay, let me tell you what we know. 
So uh, in, in those cases where actually we don't have a closed Lagrangian, okay, there are several problems, either because you have, a, for example, self-dual forms or because you don't have auxiliary fields. So there are several situations where you have such a, a Lagrangian which is not closed. So what actually we know that there are some picture change operations, some choice of these Poincaré dual forms, eta, which gives at least in component the correct answer, okay? But then we, what we have, done, we have done, we actually change this object and we are able to achieve something which is reasonable in the sense that, for example, in other formulation, let me tell you, for example, in 10 dimension superior means, which is exactly one of the example, the answer that we got is exactly the same expression that the Berkowitz got it using the Pew Spinos uh, technique. So, so this means that if you don't have auxiliary fields uh, and then you try to do the same game, you end up with the, the let's say, the, the most natural object that you get in another framework, like for example, in the Pew Spinos approach or harmonic superspace. Okay, so at the moment we don't have a definite answer. What happened if you don't have auxiliary fields? We have we have been doing some examples. Okay, it would be very nice to actually to analyze deeply uh, what is the relation between the closure of the Lagrangian, the existence of the um, of the the full Lagrangian and the correct equation motion, and the existence of auxiliary fields. So, so um, for the moment I can tell you. I mean, if you give me one example, I can tell you what I'm able to achieve and what are the results, but we don't have a complete understanding. Yes. Okay, thank you. I want to ask uh, about the, the cohomology when you introduced uh, uh, the cohomology for the first time, the, the chain, uh, uh, like, uh, yeah, if, thank you. You mean uh, yeah, this one? Uh, yeah, yes, uh, yes, uh, yes, okay. yes, 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 yeah. uh, you told that you can go um, uh, like uh, uh, to omega minus one to omega minus two two, and uh, uh, how do you, how do you go under zero uh, in the bosonic, uh, in the bosonic, um, uh, Part of the of the forms. I mean, uh, which which operator uh, allow you to? Oh, uh, yeah. Because, okay. because you, you usually mean, well, you, mean here. Have, uh... you mean here? Okay, you mean here? Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. okay. Okay. Actually, there are. It is interesting. Okay, there are two type of operators. Okay, there is a differential operator D, which is the usual differential D. Okay, which move in these directions. Okay, okay, which moves in these directions. Okay, which is the usual differential. In fact, if you do the calculation using the distributional property of the deltas, you automatically see how this works. To be precise, I, actually, um, I suggest a, a, a recent review. Uh, written by Simone Noia, which actually it put in more mathematical ground this uh, construction, okay? Um, but however, this differential operator, it moves uh, even along these uh, negatives. However, there is another operator which moves in this direction. Actually, there are two operators which move back and forth in, uh, along uh, these uh, lines, okay? And those are known as the picture change operators, which moves uh, along this line. Uh, those are interesting operators which allows you to relate uh, the integral forms to super forms, okay? So in our paper, in our work, you find uh, several examples of this. But let's say, but the idea is, is coming from string theory. So in string theory, we know, for example, that there are relations between, uh, let's say, the spectrum of string theory of a given picture to uh, the spectrum of the theory of at another pictures. And this is exactly what uh, the picture change operator does. Thank you. We also have another question, if we are not going- uh, There's a question maybe before uh, by Horst. Okay, sure, raise sure. sure. Yes, uh, a very short question and I'm very ignorant about all this formalism, but can you define characteristic classes or topological invariance in this uh, framework? 
Yes, actually, this is a, okay. This is a quite a good question, actually. So together with the Carlo Cremonini and Roberto Cremonacci, so what actually we studied, the first things we studied was, for example, the cohomology of a super Lie algebra. Okay, and that is a, is a very simple example of characteristic classes. In this case, uh, we know those are corresponds to the Casimir invariants for the Lie algebra. Okay, uh, and actually, uh, we find out that uh, you can analyze the cohomologies in different sectors. Okay, so um, indeed, we can uh, calculate uh, this expression. Yes, right. So the, there are there are already some literature about characteristic classes using also integral forms. And uh, in particular, we calculated those characteristic classes for integral forms. And there is a, another sector of the theory that I didn't explain, which is called pseudo forms, which is sitting between these complexes. And those are very interesting because, because they actually are infinite dimensional representations, which is quite, quite amazing how this works, yes. So you, you can have, for instance, extensions of the Euler character or the contracting numbers in, in these spaces? Okay, so what I, what I can tell you is what about, uh, for example, in the case of super algebras, okay, and this, this means that those characteristic classes correspond to uh, the uh, Casimir invariants, essentially, okay? So uh, there was a theorems by Fuchs uh, some years ago where actually he calculated the cohomology uh, so, which correspond to characteristic classes, cohomology of the super algebra. But actually, he was able to see some a, a sector of the of the invariance of the Casimir invariance. Using this technique, this extended technique, we are able to see all the possible invariants. Actually, the Berezin contains all these invariants. So, the corresponding characteristic class are exactly, for example, the Berezin is exactly an extended uh, characteristic class in this case. Yeah. Okay, so uh, other maybe Ruggero, uh, do you want to ask your question or you prefer to postpone it to the discussion if it is not uh, extremely urgent? I have several questions, so I can I can wait. <laughs> I suppose. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, okay. okay. So maybe we can postpone other question for the discussion now. And we now have uh, a 12 minute break and uh, bracket meet uh, at half past five. And okay. for those who will not be able maybe uh, to, to attend the discussion session, let me just remind that tomorrow uh, there will be the last day of workshop and the schedule will be the same as today. So we will start again at three tomorrow. So see you for the discussion session uh, in a while. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.